you. Um, this is a topic that in a couple of ways has already been touched upon in earlier presentations, which is always good to see um, when you do sort of interdisciplinary stuff. There's always a worry that you'll be out on a limb and no one else is talking about that sort of thing and it's not very interesting to them. So hopefully this will be somewhat interesting to you. Um, the area I'm looking at is this question of the spirit of sport. So when we say the spirit of sport is violated by doping in sport, what do we mean by that? Where do we get that idea from? And what implications does that idea have? It's a debate that we've been having for a very long time. It's a debate that seems pretty intractable. People have very different ideas about what the spirit of sport means, what should be included in the spirit of sport, and how doping in sport in particular fits into that. So I'm going to try and have a look at that together. And ultimately, to sort of foreshadow where I'm going with all of this, offer the suggestion that there is something intrinsic to sport that involves a necessary connection with morality, not just a tangential connection, not a connection that arises as a result of, for example, fame or wealth or money or um, the celebrity that comes with sport, but that is intrinsic to sport itself. And also that this shouldn't be a surprise to people, that in fact, we've been operating with this assumption for quite a long time. It just hasn't been a spoken assumption. And I'll be looking at that through the lens particularly of where this debate is most heated, and that is the use or the banning rather of non-performance enhancing drugs. So the drugs that exist on the WADA's banned list that if you take them aren't necessarily going to make you a better athlete. In fact, in many cases, they'll make you a significantly worse athlete, but they still exist on the same list as performance enhancing substances. So we're going to identify what we're arguing about. I'm going to look at crime and morality just as a, a bit of an insight into the way in which we think about rules and what is right and what is wrong the extent to which they overlap, the extent to which they don't. Um, and we'll give the example of the drug criminalisation debate because as we're all no doubt aware, people are in a debate about what drugs, if any, should be criminalised as much as they are in what drugs, if any, should be on the wider banned list. Um, and then we'll see how this feeds into the question of sport and morality more generally, and in particular, the question of what we can reasonably expect of athletes, because that's been quite central to how people have thought about the idea of sport being necessarily linked to fairness rather than sort of linked in a more tangential way. So what are we arguing about? There is, and it is an understatement to say this, widespread academic disagreement about which drugs should be banned in professional sport. There's widespread disagreement about whether there should be any drugs banned in um, sport. Julian Savalescu, sort of agent provocateur in practical ethics, has been very, very vocal. Again, just recently, I read a conversation piece from his just late last year, saying that the whole anti-doping regime is silly and we shouldn't have an anti-doping regime full stop. That view has been very influential. And when you read the sports ethics literature, you find lots of people citing Savalescu and even people who don't necessarily agree with everything he has to say, being very influenced by the shape and form of the arguments he's brought against a anti-doping regime. He's popularised essentially this notion that we should have a banned list such as it exists that is wholly centred on the question of athlete health. So unless we are banning a substance because it causes harm to an athlete, then we shouldn't be banning that substance. What we should be doing is saying here is a testosterone estrogen ratio that is safe and however you achieve that, whether you achieve it naturally or whether you achieve it through supplementation with androgens and so on and so forth, more power to you as long as you do it in a safe way. That, of course, invites a very interesting question. Why would you be interested in safety if you've already decided that you're going to have a no doping type policy? There are a lot of things we do in sport that are intrinsically unsafe and attempts to make them safe, concussions, head injuries, these sorts of things are themselves sort of vexing issues. We haven't completely reconfigured the way we do rugby simply because of the health conditions, though we are making serious and, and big changes as is appropriate. Uh, and where that debate sort of gets even more heated is as soon as you start talking about non-performance enhancing drugs, and cannabis is the number one drug that causes consternation in this context because there are jurisdictions in the world where cannabis is perfectly legal. And you have a scenario in which 
if you are tested positive in competition for cannabis use, that can cause a ban and has caused a ban in Australia quite recently. Um, Mackenzie Archer was uh, given a two year ban between 2014 and 2016. He was a pitcher. He was with Perth Heat Baseball. I think he traded to Canberra just before the ban or it may have been one of those situations where he was traded and then the ban came into place as unfortunately happens. Um, he was tested positive for dexamphetamine and uh, cannabis. Uh, there is a lot of debate about whether dexamphetamine is performance enhancing or not, though most of the literature seems to suggest there's very little evidence to suggest that it's performance enhancing in any relevant event, in any, to any relevant extent. Um, Mark Harris, similarly a table tennis player, ping pong, um, was given a ban for dexamphetamine and given that we know one of the things that dexamphetamine does is reduce your reaction times, no doubt it didn't help him very much when it came to playing ping pong. Um, Indeed, uh, one of the interesting ones that arises because the ASADA drug testing regime has its tentacles into all sorts of sports is that uh, Lisa Roberts was given a three month ban for testing positive to cannabis. She is an outrigger canoe racer. So um, we have a drug regulatory testing regime in this country that reaches into all kinds of sports and sports you wouldn't necessarily think of as falling under that kind of anti-doping banner. Um, and uh, when you talk about I don't like to use the term recreational because it seems to make them seem like they're a great time, but drugs like cocaine and, and so on and so forth, we don't need to look very far in the headlines to see NRL and AFL clubs being caught up in those kinds of scandals. So, what do we agree on? One thing there is almost universal scholarly agreement about is that the WADA's spirit of sport criteria is vague unhelpful and possibly incoherent. Um, I have in the paper a list of articles which make that claim about the WADA's spirit of sport and it is enormous. I mean, the number of articles I have found, even those that are all for banning all kinds of things, including non-performance enhancing substances, agree that, look, this is just a debacle. Why is it a debacle? Well, you only need to read the WADA's um, spirit of sport now, I hate to say definition because it's not really, but how they characterise the spirit of sport to see where the confusion arises. It's not linked to any other sporting body. So the IOC um, has a charter and they've developed that charter over a very long period of time. And there is a lot of history and rationale to the way it's been developed. It goes back to the ideals of amateurism and Olympism that underlie the Olympic Games, so on and so forth. The WADA has taken quite a different approach. What they've done is list a whole series of values and said these, in some vague way, comprise the spirit of sport. So I'll read some of them for you. Ethics, fair play and honesty, health, excellence and performance, character and, ed character and education, fun and joy, teamwork, dedication and commitment, respect for rules and laws. And what a surprise that an anti-doping authority thinks that respect for rules and laws is one of the spirits of sport. Um, perhaps if we were coming up with a list that might not make the cut or would be very low down the list. Um, respect for self, others and participants, courage, community and solidarity. If you are scratching your head saying, what does any of that mean? How do we use it as a criteria? And it's an explicit criteria for whether a drug goes on the banned list or not. A drug can be non-performance enhancing, but breach the spirit of sport, as we've seen in that list, and on that basis alone be banned. So given that we've got an unhelpful and very vague criteria, it has led many to suggest that certainly non-performance enhancing drugs that are only on the list because they violate the spirit of sport should be taken off the list and some to go further and say, well, we probably shouldn't have a banned list at all. Or if we do have a banned list, it should only consider athlete health and safety. Let's pause for a moment and have a very quick chat about crime and morality more generally, because we're all broadly comfortable with the idea that there is a necessary and intrinsic relationship between the criminal law and morality. People disagree, and this is largely what politics is about, about what particularly should be a crime, but they can have that disagreement without disagreeing that crime is morally problematic most of the time. Very few people would say there is no moral element to crime. And when I get occasionally push back on this from students, I ask, well, 
you know, yes, it may be that you break the law sometimes, and it may be that you don't think it's a particularly big issue that you break the law. You might jaywalk, for example. But in the literature on legal theory, we call that a law that negatively affects your self-interest. You've got a self-interest in wanting to cross the road when it's quick and convenient, and you've got a law that countervails against it. And what you've done essentially is made an assessment that your self-interest outweighs your obligation to the law because you don't feel it's particularly strong. Rarely would you say you have no obligation to the law whatsoever. It's just that it's outweighed in this case. To put it another way, if I called you a criminal, I am not merely saying something descriptive. I'm saying something normative. I'm saying something about your ethical capacity, your goodness or badness as a person. No one would take the word criminal as a purely descriptive, um, you know, that is a fact about some act I have undertaken. You'd say, well, they're saying I'm a bad person. So we have a, I guess, parallel debate to the drugs in sport debate about drug criminalization generally. And it's a very contentious debate. But it's a different debate in substance. So I've used Scher and Husak as two philosophers who happen to have been arguing about this in a journal fairly recently. But there are a number of examples you can give on both sides of the debate about what, if any, substances should be criminalised. And they both disagree, but they disagree about the relative merits of decriminalising drugs. They disagree about the effect that decriminalising will have, whether it will be more harmful or less harmful overall to the population. They don't disagree about the essential terms of the debate. That is, they don't have a disagreement fundamentally that there is a link between crime and ethics or crime and morality. They simply have different views about what we should prioritise in that debate and how that debate should be undertaken. Even people who take a very hard line kind of libertarian approach to crime, that kind of classic John Stuart Mill harm principle approach to what we should criminalise. Unless it harms a person who hasn't consented to that harm, people should be allowed to do whatever they like. We hear that position taken occasionally. Some of our politicians quite famously take that quite libertarian position. But what we often forget is that when John Stuart Mill proposed that position in his famous treatise on liberty, he gave it for entirely moral reasons. He said, this is a classic utilitarian justification for having the harm principle as to when we should and shouldn't legislate. That is, the chances are that politicians will get wrong what is actually immoral and they'll make things illegal when they're not really immoral. They're just they have an incorrect sentiment, they have religious values, they have social values that they're not willing to challenge and so they'll be incorrect about it. So the greatest good for the greatest number, the classic utilitarian ethical justification, is to have a harm principle restriction on what we criminalise and what we don't. So even if you're taking a very hard line sort of, you know, we should criminalise very few things, the intrinsic and underlying justification for that is quite often a very standard utilitarian ethics type justification. What this means is that in debates about drug criminalisation, because we all agree on the terms, at least in theory, one person is right and the other is wrong. I mean, it might be hard to work out who is right and who is wrong, but the debate isn't incommensurate. The debate has an end point. We haven't found it yet, but no doubt it will. By contrast, the very classic debate about the banning of performance enhancing drugs in sport and by implication also non-performance enhancing drugs um, does seem intractable. Um, and I've used Devine as a foil to Julian Savulescu's very famous articles that no doubt many of you have read. It's in the British Journal of Medic Medicine and, and it's cited all of the time. Um, Devine has responded to that by saying, well, no, no, there are lots of things intrinsic to sport that we might want to protect and we've got good reasons to want to protect them. Um, and we can protect those values by banning certain kinds of substances um, that on grounds that are not simply athlete health. And because they have a sort of fundamental disjunction, essentially a disagreement about the terms of the debate, is sport and morality an intrinsic necessary connection or should we just get rid of it and think only about athlete health? It doesn't seem there's a lot, there's very much for that to go. Um, what I want to suggest is that it shouldn't surprise us to learn that 
sport and morality have an intrinsic connection because what is sport other than a social practice? It's a practice engaged in by groups of people. And should we be surprised that any time you have groups of people interacting, you have necessary and intrinsic moral problems that have to be solved. There are necessary and intrinsic moral connections between the way people act in groups. For example, certain kinds of rules about conduct are almost universal in professional sport. I can't point you to a sport anywhere on the planet that allows you to abuse umpires. I can't point you to a sport anywhere on the planet that allows you to break the rules and then not have a significant infraction for trying to cover up the breaking of the rule, for acting in such a way as to prevent the rules of the sport from being applied. If we don't think there is a necessary connection between sport and morality, this proves a big problem. Why has it happened by accident that all sports everywhere have sort of generated these kinds of broad classes of rules? I suggest it's because like all kinds of human interaction, moral issues arise. Sandra Lynch, who's written very extensively on the question of um, the spirit of sport and the ethics of sport more generally, reminds us that Olympic ideals of fair play and amateurism are often a convenient historical forgetfulness. We find um, professional athletes even in the ancient Greek period in the sense that they are being paid or sponsored. Um, Lynch contends that athletes are not possessed of any qualities that make them intrinsically superior moral agents. I guess that depends on your sport. Um, for example, I uh, train and referee in wrestling where I can assure you we're all moral paragons, but it may be that in other sports that's not the case. Um, Lynch binds up the question of athlete morality in a broader question about status, wealth and celebrity, and she follows the classic dispute um, between Charles Barkley and Karl Malone. That is, um, Charles Barkley, you'll remember, was the face of Nike's I Am Not A Role Model campaign. Dunking a basketball does not make me fit to um, raise your children. His teammate Karl Malone said, look, we don't have a choice. We are role models. Our only choice is whether to be good or bad role models. The question is, are athletes phronomos? Phronomos, ancient Greek word, meaning essentially that they are kinds of moral paragons who are to be emulated. The immediate rejoinder to this is, well, aren't we being a bit precious? I mean, are athletes really expected to be moral paragons? Because clearly athletes are not saints and nor should we expect them to be. And, and Charles Barkley is quite right, simply because he can dunk a basketball doesn't mean he should raise my children. That would be silly. But... And it's an important but. Well, of course, there are still degrees and levels of fair play that we can expect of people. And of course, it depends on your position within the sport. If you are captain of the Australian Test cricket team, more is expected of you in terms of your leadership position than is expected of Shane Warne, who was notoriously not made captain of the Australian Test team, not because he wouldn't have been a good captain. He made an excellent captain of the Rajasthani Royals. Um, largely, I suspect his off-field indiscretions had a lot to do with why he was never made captain. We get excited about sport and morality for the same reason we get excited about politicians and morality, for the same reason we get excited about celebrities and morality, because every time you've got groups of people together, of course you've got a necessary connection. Now, we might get too excited and we might have inappropriate ideals about what we can sort of aspire to for athletes. But I think that's the debate we should be having, not a debate about whether sport and morality connects at all. So taken literally, I think the argument that there is no connection between sport and morality starts to break down. It seems absurd. And if that intuition is correct, then it follows that there is therefore no, there is a necessary connection. And thus we should be arguing about the nature and extent and terms of that rather than its existence. If this is right, what are the consequences? Well, the consequences are first that Julian Savalescu is wrong, and it's always nice to be able to say that. Um, athlete health is not the only factor that approves in doping. The spirit of sport can be extended to the reasonable moral expectations on athletes, but also not further than that, that if we're going beyond what we can reasonably expect of athletes, well, the spirit of sport shouldn't be doing that work. And the debate should become about the extent of the limits rather than their existence, 
which is where we will leave it. Thank you very much.